Well, good morning and happy slightly early Thanksgiving. Uh, I hope you're excited about giving thanks this Thursday with whoever you are celebrating with, be it family or friends or fellow church members. Uh, Last Sunday, if you were with us, we talked about the importance of, of doing this well, making sure that we slow down in our lives long enough to really consider how blessed we are and how much we have to be thankful for especially as we talked about last Sunday, about relative to Christians in other eras who lived under much less favorable conditions. And I got some really good feedback from last Sunday's message. People talked about how it was helpful in reminding you about all the little details uh, that you rarely think about, ways that God has blessed you. And even though you, you may think, well, there's still some areas in my life which I wish were easier or better, whether it's your job, your finances, your living situation, your dating life, whatever it is, it's so easy to get wrapped up in those things that we want so badly and forget and take for granted the many gracious gifts that the Lord gives us each and every day. So as I said last week, giving thanks is nothing new to us. That is not a new concept. It's something we all realize is important, but because we are so forgetful as a people and because we're so busy as a people, It is important for us to be reminded often, not just one day of the year, but reminded often about how much we have and how little we deserve it. And so I hope based on last Sunday and what you're going to hear this morning, you'll be more and more prepared to celebrate well on Thursday when you give thanks. Now, let's talk about today's message. Uh, Hold on to your seats. This morning, I want to continue our Thanksgiving theme in a very unique way. We are going way outside the normal box together this morning. This is something that I've actually done twice in the 17 plus years of the life of our church. Both times it seems to have been a blessing to our congregation, so we'll see what happens today. What I wanna do this morning is read to you a pastoral letter that is uniquely adapted to this body of believers. And the model for this letter actually comes from a letter that you will find in your Bibles. It's Paul's letter to the Colossian church. So before I just jump in and read this, why don't you grab your Bibles and let's actually go to the book of Colossians and just take a quick note, just a glance, we don't have a lot of time, at how the book of Colossians is structured. Go to the very first chapter of Colossians. As you arrive there, you're going to find that it has only four chapters, so it's not a long letter but it is packed full of practical instructions and encouragement, not just for the church back then, but for the church even today. Uh, Just a couple uh, notes about the background here. Recall that Paul wrote this letter to the believers in this this somewhat rural city of Colossae at a time when he he was serving a prison sentence in a Roman jail. Let's also remember that Paul did not plant this particular church. This was not one of his church plants, and in fact, there's no evidence he ever actually visited Colossae or met the believers in that community, which raises the obvious question, well, then how did they get a letter, right? Uh, That's one of the great things I want to know in heaven. Well, Lord, how did you decide which churches actually got a letter? Well, it appears that the church was planted by a friend of Paul's, a co-worker named Epaphras, who was a native to that area. And sometime around the year A.D. 58, Epaphras traveled to Rome to visit Paul in prison, both to encourage him and to get some counsel from the great apostle concerning a few issues. So Paul then wrote back to the believers in Colossae, addressing the issues that Epaphras brought to him, but in general challenging them to keep growing spiritually and to keep growing in their devotion to Christ. Now, the structure of Colossians is actually very easy to follow in terms of its flow and logic. I'll put a few things on the screen just so that you can understand the basic flow, and this is going to help you as I read my pastoral letter. I think it's going to help you understand why I've included what I've included because it follows the same natural flow. So if you look at chapter one, again, this is going to be quick at a glance. You'll see that Paul starts out with a theme that's very important for the season we're in right now, prayer and thanksgiving. And then if you want to circle this at verse 15, there's a shift in tone. You guys like to mark up your Bibles? This is a good place you write a line or circle verse 15. Paul transitions, shifts to some of the most important and highest Christology that you will find in the entire New Testament, the theme being this, the preeminence of Christ. 
And then in verse 24, he finishes the chapter with a discussion of how he has labored and suffered on behalf of the gospel and for the spread of the church in the Greek world. Then if you look at chapter 2, and we're gonna, again, we're going quickly through this, you'll see Paul walk through an extensive teaching on how believers in the church need to be rooted and built up in Christ and knit together in love. And then there's a transition to verse 16 where he addresses a, a particular legalistic heresy that had infected the Colossian church, and he reminds them that you're free in Christ and not subject to man-made regulations. That's chapter 2. If you go over to chapter 3, you see Paul exhorts the believers to recognize who they belong to. And since they belong to Christ, they should put on the new self, put on a new way of life that reflects the example that they have in Christ. Then there's a transition to verse 18. Paul turns to some very practical topics, probably something that Epaphras had asked him about, relationships within the Christian household, husbands and wives, children and parents, masters and slaves. And then finally, take a look at chapter 4. Here's where you see Paul's heart for people really come out. He gives final instructions. He comes back to where he started with prayer and thanksgiving. He shares wisdom about how we should deal with outsiders, how we should relate to them. And then he sends beautiful greetings from all of his co-laborers, letting the believers in Colossae know how much they are loved by the saints. So it's beautiful. It's a beautiful flow. It's, it's simple. Um, but now let's get to my letter. And I, I want you to hear this really clearly before I start this morning. What I'm doing is using scripture as a guide to compose a letter to you guys specifically from God the Father. Now, as I say that, you go, wow, that's dangerous. You're writing on behalf of God, okay? Understand, I am not trying to be presumptuous here. I am not God, obviously. Ask my wife. I am not an apostle, obviously. I am not trying to write holy, inerrant scripture, obviously. Make sure you understand that. And if you're visiting this morning and you're now furring your brow, wondering what's going on, this is a unique Sunday. Come back next Sunday. We're, we're going to be in the Gospel of Luke talking about Christmas. So just trust me, this is a unique Sunday. What you're about to hear is my attempt to adapt the message of Colossians to Oak Hill and to apply its timeless principles to our lives together as a church family. And in the spirit of thanksgiving, as we go through this, what I'm gonna do is ask you to pause. I'm gonna put some questions on the screen about what you're thankful for. Because we wanna get ready to thank, to give thanks well this week. So sit back and relax. If you wanna sort of track with me through the letter, that's, you can do that or you can just listen. But make sure you're listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit as he guides your heart and guides your mind to track with me. And my hope is that this morning you'll come out of here encouraged with hope and joy and most of all with thanksgiving. Amen? All right, here we go. Chapter one. How many chapters in Colossians? Okay, chapter one is the longest one. Chapter one. To the saints in Christ at Oak Hill, my beloved children in Santa Clarita, Grace and peace to each of you from my heart to yours. Many prayers for you and for your church have risen to my throne, especially prayers of thanksgiving for the work I'm doing among you. Since the day I gathered you together and planted Oak Hill Bible Church, many have heard of your faith and the fervent love that you have for one another. I have seen how vibrant your fellowship is and how you long to serve and care for each other in many practical ways. And I see the word of truth is increasing among you and constantly bearing fruit through the power of my spirit. You're learning about gospel life from your elders and your fellow bond servants, Adam and Grant and Dave and Ross and Ken and the two Jeffs. They're a group of men who are still a work in process, but they're faithfully striving to shepherd you well. They continue to pray for you that you would be filled with the knowledge of my will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. They desire that you walk each day in a manner worthy of the one you worship, to please me in all respects and to continually increase in knowledge and good deeds. 
It is I, the Lord, who gives you the strength and power to do this. While your elders serve as good examples for you to imitate, only I can grant you the power, the endurance, and the patience that you need as a pilgrim sojourning through life in a fallen world. So be thankful and glorify my name, for I am the one who not only strengthens your walk, but qualifies you to share in the eternal inheritance of the saints. Lest you forget, there was once a time when every single one of you belonged to the kingdom of darkness. You were born into it, your nature corrupted by generation after generation of human sin. And therefore, on your own, you were incapable of turning your hearts towards me in faith. In short, you were lost and helpless and without hope. But all that's changed now. Now in Christ, you have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Why? How did that happen? Before I laid the foundations of the universe, I already knew you. And I purposed to save you, to rescue you from your hopeless condition according to my perfect timing. I delivered you from the deepest pit, and now by my sovereign hand, you've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of my beloved son. And when I say that all of your sins have been washed away, I mean it. Past sins, present sins, even future sins. Because, the, because of the cleansing blood of my son has been applied to your account, those sins are buried forever. There is now no condemnation. Of this you can be sure. Let me pause for a second. Let's talk about thankfulness. Are you thankful for the vibrant fellowship here at Oak Hill? Are you thankful for the team of men the Lord has brought together as shepherds here? Are you thankful that God has rescued you, washed away your sins, and brought you into the kingdom of light? I'll continue. Listen, my children, you were purchased at a very high cost. My son is precious to me, more precious than you can even understand. But it was I who crushed him. It was I who made him a guilt offering for you. In fact, I was pleased to do this. That's how much I love you. But still, you should know how valuable that sacrifice was, and you should never stop contemplating it. Why is it so valuable? Because of who Jesus was and is. You know him by many names, the Christ, the Anointed One, the Messiah, the Savior, and yes, he is a son, but not a son as you understand that term on earth. Many have stumbled over this over the centuries, so beware. Since the early days of the church, teachers have come in my name, claiming to speak truth, but they are wolves among the flock because they have not rightly understood the nature of my son. And by their teaching, many have been led astray. So let me set the record straight. When you see Jesus, you see me. He is my icon, my exact image and likeness. Beloved, make sure you get this right. Jesus is not less than me. He is not a God. He is fully God. He is my equal in all of his nature and attributes. I know this is not easy for your finite minds to fully grasp, but you must know that it's true. Trust me, I've declared it so. My son is also supreme over all creation. Everything made bows to him. Why? It's very simple. Everything in the heavens and everything on earth and under the earth found its beginning in him. He is the agent of all creation. All things came into being through my son. That's why the angels bow to him. And that's why the rebellious demons are subject to him. Every created thing finds its purpose in him. He was in the beginning with me before anything came into existence. And even now, he holds the created order together, fixing everything in its proper place. Let's pause again. Are you thankful that the Father crushed his one and only Son for your sake? Are you thankful today that God himself came down to earth God himself came down to earth and took on flesh and suffered to redeem you.
Children, one more thing you need to remember about my son. He is Lord over the church. It's his body and he is its head. It belongs to him. Which church, you might ask? Well, understand, there is, no, there is, there is only one true church, but it's never been found in a particular denomination or in one particular building or even in one city. The true church is a vast cross-section of humanity from every nation, every race, every tribe, and every tongue. It's made up of those who I have chosen and drawn to myself, those whose hearts I have regenerated. And as a result, they've placed their trust in me by faith alone and not by their good works. These elect saints belong to my son, and he will never leave them, he will never forsake them, and he will never lose any of them. They will be raised up on the last day. Count on it. The plan to save each of you originated in eternity past, according to the counsel of my will. To accomplish that plan, it was my pleasure to have all the fullness of the Godhead dwell in my son. Yes, even as he walked the earth in human flesh. And as he suffered and died on that Roman cross, peace was established between you and me. We are now reconciled. Does that not bring you great joy? Beloved, let me expand on this picture of reconciliation so that you might grasp how deep and wide my love is for you. There was a time when you were absolutely alienated from me. You had turned your backs on the whole idea of God. Your minds were full of hostility towards me. Your entire life was an act of rebellion against the very one who created you. It's hard to believe, isn't it? Now, if I were merely a human being, I would have returned that hostility and kind. I would have ignored you, left you in your, to your own wicked desires, and in the end, judged you and snuffed out your life for all eternity. But I am not a man. Rather than respond with hostility, I have chosen to make you my friend. And not just a friend as you know it on earth, I've adopted you as my own, a son, a daughter, an heir to all that I possess. And all of this is for my glory that in the ages to come, you and everyone else might come to see how merciful and mighty I am. Let's pause. Are you thankful today that Jesus is head of the church and that you are part of his body you've been made part of his body are you thankful that you've been reconciled to God as you sit here this morning are you thankful to be adopted into God's family as a child and as an heir someday my children every one of you will leave this physical world and pass it into eternity if you've been reconciled to me through the death of my son, when you come before my throne for judgment, I will see only Jesus in you. And I will pro proclaim you to be holy and blameless. How is that possible? I have declared it. And there is no other way. You cannot do this by yourselves. It is solely an act of my grace. For now, though, there's something you must do during your days on the earth. You must endure in your faith. I've set you free and given you the power to reason and to make very real choices, so choose wisely in the way that you walk. Be firmly established in the truth of my word. Become immovable in your faith. Never give up on the hope that you have. I want you to know something about my servant, Paul, who I chose to write many important letters in my word. He suffered greatly for the sake of the gospel in his day, and to some degree, you too, will have to endure suffering. But men like Paul, who've been called to reveal the mysteries of Christ through the teaching and preaching of the word, they will come under great attack. So pray for your leaders at Oak Hill. They strive with the strength that I provide them to proclaim, warn, and teach you with all wisdom, and they do it with one goal in mind, that each of you would become mature in Christ. One last pause before we get to chapter two. Are you thankful today that God sees you as holy and blameless because of Christ? Do you believe that's true? That God sees you as holy and blameless? Chapter two. 
Beloved, here's another set of reasons why your elders struggle in prayer on your behalf. They want every member of the body at Oak Hill to be joined together in love and have all the riches of understanding and knowledge concerning my son. Whenever you're together, he must be your focus because all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in him and discovered in him. So then, just as you've received Jesus as Lord, abide with him, walk with him, be rooted and built up in the faith concerning him. That's what your leaders have been telling you. And be thankful. In fact, be overflowing with gratitude. I exhort you in these ways for a very important reason, friends. There are many opinions about Jesus out there, so be careful. I've told you exactly who my son is. So do not let anyone delude you with some worldly philosophical argument that contradicts what I've already said in my word. Your church is now almost 18 years old, and I have delighted to see your growth in discipline and in the solid stub substance of your faith. What a joy to see Miles and Brandon, Veronica and Elijah and Kenzie on fire for the gospel. To them and to the rest of you, I say this, you're on the right track, do not deviate from it. Watch out for people who try to take you captive with so-called new perspectives on what Holy Scripture teaches. They seek to drag you away by their foolishness and deceit, and their arguments have no basis in the truth. Rather, their sources are simply this, wicked desires mixed with worldly logic backed by spiritual forces of darkness. Such people do not know me or my son. Behold, I've already warned you through my servant Solomon. There is a way which seems right to a man, but in the end its way is death. So stay alert and make sure you don't fall into the clutches of these people or their false teaching. Remember, you don't need worldly ideas to make you complete, for I have made you complete in Jesus. He is the fullness of the Godhead, and he is the head over every ruler and every authority in heaven and on earth. Through him, the power of sin in your life has been stripped away. Do you not realize that if you know my son, you've already been buried with him in baptism? Do you not know that already you've been raised to life with him by faith? Never forget, my beloved, there was once a certificate of debt sitting in front of me with your name on it, a list of decrees which laid out all of your sins. I remember the names, Sam. Scott, Esme, Olivia, Andrew, Kristen, Wesley, Sarai, Polly, Serena, and not just those, but every other person at Oak Hill. Trust me, it did not look good for any of you. Not for Brianna, Emmy, Logan, Riley, Katie, Ryan, or Molly. You were all dead in your sins. But that's when I moved. I made you alive together with Jesus. You literally went from eternal condemnation to eternal life. That nasty certificate of debt was canceled, taken out of the way, and nailed to the cross. And on that cross, the dark spiritual forces were stripped of their false authority. They were marched naked through the streets, humility, humiliated for all the world to see. And now, for each of you, the curse of the law is wiped out. Death has been overcome, and fear no longer has a hold over you. Let's pause again. Are you thankful this morning that you've been buried with Christ in death? and raised with him to new life? Are you thankful that that certificate of debt that you once owed to God has been erased and wiped clean? Do we not have a lot to be thankful for? Let me continue. So in light of all these things, friends, don't let anyone out there pressure you over non-essential matters. Things like what you should eat or not eat. What you, what you should drink or not drink. Don't let legalistic teachers tell you what holidays you should observe or not observe. 
All such human regulations are mere shadows. Stay focused on Jesus. He is the substance. Also ignore all of the distracting noise about things like ascetic practices and rituals that are devoid of meaning and chasing after visions and false worship that's rooted purely in emotionalism. Have you not noticed that people who claim to participate in these things become inflated in their own minds? That's because they've lost connection to the source of life, the head from whom the true body of Christ is held together. So now think, if you've died with Jesus to the human logic and man-made traditions of this world, why would you submit yourself to a set of rules and practices which I have not commanded you? For goodness sake, Jesus came to set you free, so be free. This world is no longer your home, and all these conflicting ideas about eating and drinking and observing will one day perish. The fools who engage in such legalistic behavior may at times look pious and humble, but I know the truth about their hearts. They're just showing off, trying to make themselves look more godly than they are, and in reality, None of their practices have any value in curbing sinful desires. Before we get to chapter three, one more pause. Are you thankful today that you are free in Christ? Are you thankful that your faith is in the living God and not in man-made rules and regulations? Be thankful. Chapter three. So, my saints, if, as you sit here this morning, you've been brought to life and reconciled to me through my Son, if you've been brought out of darkness and into the kingdom of light, then stop looking around at your circumstances. Stop being consumed with worry. And stop seeking the ungodly pleasures of this world. Instead, shift your mind and your heart to things above, where Christ is seated at my right hand. I'm going to give you some insight into a mystery that Paul talked about in his letter to the saints in Colossae long ago. You have already died. David, Brooke, Seth, Lena, Isabel, Preston, Julie, Bruno, you've all died. I know that your physical heart is still beating. But hear this lofty spiritual truth. Long ago, you were crucified with Jesus. You were raised from the dead with him, and you were seated in the heavenly realms with us. And yet for now, for a short time, for a vapor, your life does go on. But trust me, your life is hidden in my son. And here's the best news of all. A great day is coming when I will send him back to the earth to judge and to rule and to reign. He will be revealed in great glory and you too will be revealed right alongside him in glory. Alex, Chris, Barbara, Bill, Ron and Kim, can you imagine what it will be like to reign in a perfected, glorified body with no sin, no illness, no pain, and no more heartache? Can you imagine it? Before I get weepy, (laughs) let me pause again. Are you thankful that spiritually you are already seated with Christ in the heavenly realms? That's how secure your salvation is. Are you thankful for that this morning? Are you thankful for the promise that he's coming back? I hope so. Now, as you wait for the return of my son, I have some instructions for you. Don't check out on me just because your salvation is secure. There's work to be done. Start by putting to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual sin, impurity, lust, and the evil desires that leak from your heart. These are all forms of idolatry, and I am a jealous God who will deal with any idol that threatens to steal away your heart. You once walked in those things, but no more. Alongside the sins of the flesh, you must put aside the kinds of unmet desires that destroy relationships. Anger, malice, slander, profanity, abusive language, and lying to one another. 
These are not fit for children of the king. Why would a child of the king wear such a filthy set of clothes? Put to death the old self. That's not who you are anymore. And in its place, put on the new self. Put on your true identity in Christ as if you're slipping on a new set of garments. Every new piece of clothing is custom made by my son with his label on it. From now on, there are no category distinctions between any of you. Jew, Gentile, barbarian, slave, freeman, white, black, brown, red, or yellow. These things don't matter in the long run. All that matters is this. Which set of clothes do you have on? Will you be found in Christ or not? That's all that matters. And here's the things I want you to put on. The very same garments that Christ modeled for you. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Follow your master. It is a privilege to wear the garments that he did. Now hear me, children. I've not called you to be new individuals only. Together I've called you to be a new people. And it begins in your local church right there at Oak Hill. I want you to bear with one another's weaknesses and faults. I know it's not always easy to do that, but this is what makes you different from the world. Think the best of your brothers and sisters. Recognize spiritual growth in them, even if they still have a long way to go, because that's true of you as well. So bear with them and forgive. By all means, forgive. When they disappoint you, forgive them. When they say something unkind, forgive them. When they do something that seems insensitive, forgive. Do you understand how much I've forgiven you? If you did, you would never withhold forgiveness from a brother or sister. In your daily lives, let the peace of God the Son rule your hearts. Peace with others, yes, but also peace within. To have that, you're going to have to trust me. And why wouldn't you? I am sovereign over every circumstance, every sickness, every paycheck, every child, every bird, and every blade of grass. If you want peace, my peace I give to you. I also desire that you let my word dwell richly within you, in your devotional life, in your Sunday gatherings, in your community groups, in your casual lunch or coffee dates, in your entire life as a body together. Let my word sink in deeply. Read it, study it, pray it, feed on it, teach one another, and correct one another from my word. Sing it as well. Sing the words of Scripture. Sing psalms and hymns and all kinds of spiritual songs. And if you can't carry a tune, sing anyway. Don't worry. You don't have to sing as well as Ariana or Carly or Akela or Laura or Becca to get my attention I will receive your praise. My beloved, whatever you do, in word or deed, do it all in the name of my son. When you clean the bathroom, when you do the dishes, when you take out the trash cans, when you drive to work, when you're eating dinner with your kids, everything you do, do it all to my glory as you give thanks. Did you know that Daniel coaches basketball for my glory? that Emma writes music for my glory, that Jason sells hardware products for my glory. Did you know that Tom, Alex, Glenn, and Josh work for me in Hollywood of all places? It's all for my glory. So pause. Are you thankful for the privilege of living out the one and others in this local church? That is a privilege. Are you thankful for the privilege of forgiving others just as Christ has forgiven you? Are you thankful that Oak Hill puts the word of God at the center of everything we do? That's an important truth. My children, let me get really practical now. I care deeply about your households. I'm a God of design and order, and I have declared my design and my order for your family. It was divinely instituted from the very beginning of time in the garden. So to question it or to try to go your own way is the absolute height of foolishness. 
Your home should operate in a way that honors me and makes you different from the world. So are you ready? This won't be easy. Wives, I want you to follow your husbands. I want you to back off and let him lead your family. I know this may be hard. You may think you're a better leader. You may think that he's not a strong leader right now, but I want you to trust me in this. Danny and Sarah and Kaylee and Zariah, Caitlin and Mariah, Kelsey and Sage, Brittany and Tierney, I've called your husbands to lead. And if you try to step in and usurp his leadership, it's not only a sin against me, but it will bring you unhappiness and create chaos in your homes. So beware. You will certainly struggle with this. And when you do, I want you to look past your husband's faults and look at my son. Trust me with this command. And if you need help on how to do it well, you have Tanya and Carol and Jesse and Meredith that you can talk to. They will give you lots of wise counsel from the years of experience in marriage. Husbands, your job is even more difficult than what I just gave to your wives. Are you ready? Zach and Luke and Matt and Colton and Caleb and Mario and Josiah and Travis, I want you to love your wives using Jesus as your model. That means you're to be a servant leader, one who puts the needs of your wife before your own. Be humble in your leadership. Be gentle and kind, never taking advantage of your role as the authority in the home. If you fail in this area, I will hold you responsible. So beware. For children still living in the home, do what your parents tell you. Amen? It's as simple as that. I know you don't always feel like it. I know you think you've got everything figured out and your parents don't have a clue. But guess what? They do know a few things. They do know a few things about being a child, about being a teenager, and I have called them to guide you during these difficult years. But you have to speak less and listen more. If you'll obey them, you will please me. Parents, you've been given a huge stewardship responsibility. Blaine and Kelsey, Mike and Cassie, Dylan and Juliana, Josh and Yael, Robert and Kimberly, TJ and Rana, Mason and Sabrina, you are to shepherd those little hearts and lives in your household. So raise, teach, and guide them carefully. Never forget that you have the privilege of representing me before your kids. You get to be an example of godliness that they can imitate. Don't neglect to discipline your kids in order to keep them on track, but as you do, do not squash their spirit and cause them to lose heart. That would be a great tragedy, for I desire that they flourish under your loving hand. Those of you who are employees... Tori, Andy, Ben, Tammy, I want you to work hard and I want you to put in the hours required of you, whether you work from a physical office or from your home. Obey those I put in authority over you. I know that some of your bosses are difficult to follow, but remember, as you work throughout the day, you're really serving me, not your boss. So don't just do the minimum to get by and collect a paycheck Work with real integrity from the heart. And even if you don't get paid what you're worth, never forget that I will someday give you the ultimate inheritance. So be patient. It's worth it. If you're a boss over others where you work, like Jaden or Stephen, Tom or Simon, the authority you wield in the lives of others carries great responsibility in my eyes. You must be fair you must be generous and you must be righteous in the way you deal with those I have put under your care. As you go throughout your workday, never forget that you have a boss too, a boss in heaven. And I will someday judge both employee and employer without regard to earthly positions. On the day of judgment, there is no favoritism. All are equal in my courtroom. Never forget this. Before we wrap up with chapter four, a few more questions. Are you thankful for God's design and ordering of your household? Are you thankful for that plan? 
Are you thankful for the role that God has called you to play within the family? Chapter four. Finally, my children, never forget that you are a foot soldier in a great spiritual battle that is playing out in real time. Contend for the faith that's been passed down to you, the same faith I delivered to you through my prophets and apostles. I want you to pick up the weapons that I've provided to you and take ground for the kingdom. And to that end, I've given you two unique weapons that come with my sovereign power behind them, your prayers and your witness. Devote yourself to prayer. Abide with me all day long, even as you're doing your earthly tasks. Take every thought captive. Bring every trial and temptation that you face before me. I'll be there. I'll listen, and I'll help you guard your heart. Make sure that you stay alert. Remember, the enemy seeks to distract you and discourage you. And if you stumble into your day without a thought or prayer, he will devour you. So don't fall asleep at your post. Speaking of prayer, make sure to lift up the missionaries, evangelists, and pastors that are on the front lines of the battle. Make sure that all of the elders and their wives are on your regular prayer list, plus Chris, who leads your evangelism table, Malia and others at Children's Hunger Fund, and Josh and Allie, who desire to go abroad in the coming years. I have ordained your prayers as a means to accomplish my will through them. So pray for open doors for my word to go forth, and pray that my ambassadors will clearly proclaim the gospel. That's one of my favorite prayers to answer. Children, each one of you has a specific mission when it comes to evangelism. I work through my servants to bring my elect into the kingdom, so stay on mission. Whenever you're among unbelievers, be careful how you act. Check your attitude and make sure it reflects my love. Be self-aware as you mingle with people who might be open to the gospel. Victoria, Stone, Isaac, are you praying and watching? Sophia, Kristen, Lizzie, are you prepared to share your faith? Divine opportunities will come your way, so make the most of every opportunity that I give to you. And remember, beloved, watch your speech carefully. Your conversations with unbelievers should always be filled with a balance of grace and truth. And when you speak about your faith, let all the flavor of your relationship with me come out. Make it tasty, make it attractive. One last pause and then we'll finish. Are you thankful this morning for the gift and privilege of prayer to be able to speak to the creator of the universe? Are you thankful that God has called you to be an ambassador for his saving gospel? Church at Oak Hill, the saints up here in heaven send their greetings. I testify that they have a great concern for you and for all the other believers in Santa Clarita. They send greetings to Megan and Ella, to Eugene and Michaela, those who labor in leading your worship. They send their greetings to uh, the other deacons, Alex and Blake, Connor, Glenn and Laura, men and women who are devoted to the church and who constantly pray on behalf of the congregation at Oak Hill. I love you all, and I'm with you always even to the end of the age, your Father in heaven. You bow your heads. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, even as we, as we adapt the message that you have given to the church from the first century to today, Lord, the way you have communicated your truth to us is so beautiful to sit back and just enjoy how much you have loved us by communicating so clearly to us who you are, who we are, what you have done for us. Lord, we are a thankful people this morning, thankful for so many things that were included in the the letter that Paul wrote to the Colossians, things that, Lord, we may have taken for granted, may not have thought about in so long. Father, I pray by your spirit that you would bring those things to our hearts and minds this Thanksgiving season and give us the privilege of 
of talking to you about it and praising you for all of it. So God, I pray that as this letter seeks, seeps into the hearts of our body that, that, Lord, it wouldn't be my voice, it wouldn't be Jeff's voice that they hear, but your voice, your spirit speaking to them. So thank you for this time this morning. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.